morning. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, I hear oh, Sorry, my internet was like not working for a second. That and could was possibly like... happen to me also. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna make you a co-host too, so that if you have, you know, any PowerPoint slides or anything like that, okay. that you want to share. I don't have them on my iPad. I can email them to you guys real quickly or sure. to you. Sure. Would do that yeah i can do that and then pull it up and okay let me my computer is right here so mm -hmm. let me do that real fast is taylor corbin here yet taylor corbin Brittany moreno i see taylor he's in here sorry okay Ashley Smith. I'm here. Here you are. And Danica St. Germain. Load in. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm over in my email. I've never, done, Wait. I've never done PowerPoints on Zoom yet. So we're all learning here, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, man. Ms. Erickson? Yes. Hi, Hannah. Danica said that she's having internet issues, so she'll be here. Thank you. Did you get the PowerPoint, Penny? Um... Not yet. Okay. I'll refresh and we'll see. Can 
Yep, just came. Perfect. Can you guys hear me okay? I can. How about everybody else? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Would you like me to start? Are we still waiting on people? Um, I think we're going to wait for Danica, right? Is Danica going to be able to get in, guys? Did she text you? She just said her internet wasn't working and she's trying to fix it. So. Okay. Let's see if I can pull this up. It's open now, so I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't really know how to do it on the iPad, too. I'm using my iPad. Sometimes, like, if I get too many open. Have you guys been doing class on Zoom for a while? Yes. <laughs> right, guys? Is it under, is it this oh. one, nursing orientation? Yep. Yep, there you go. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Except that, look, I didn't go to the front of it. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Let me just see if everybody's, there we go. And does everybody see it? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Great. I'm gonna grab one more thing. Okay, Danica's here, great. Did everybody remember to fill out the attendance assignment and submit it? Okay, make sure you do that, okay? It'll be open throughout class so you can do it on the next break if you didn't do it. Okay, let me introduce to all of you, Ms. Kira Green. She is a child life specialist at Tucson Medical Center in the emergency room mostly, right Kira? Yes, I'm switching to Peds and PICU in November though. Okay, as the census, they're anticipating the census will be going back up at that time? Well, so Jordan left the position, and so it's kind of been open. There's been lots of changes within our role during COVID and everything. Um, so me and Carrie are splitting peds in the morning and then going to the emergency room at night. So in November, I'm fully switching to peds and PICU. And I'll just like, personally, I approve of that. I think the children will be in really good hands, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and class, I just, I just really want to emphasize how important it is that we collaborate with child life. They have this unique training in how to explain things to children. And, you know, this is what we're going to be talking about. We do not want children to be traumatized, right? I feel right. like when we go to those adult units and you see these adults that have problems, chronic health issues, and they have this poor relationship with health professionals, it's a lot of times it's because they might have been sick as a child and had a traumatic experience. You know, a lot of times I'll talk about how like if your first visit to the dentist is bad, you will mm -hmm. never want to go back to the dentist again. So, you know, as a nurse, if we want to advocate for children in you know, normalize their hospital experience, we have got to draw on the expertise of child life and collaborate with them. So with that, you know, kind of segue, can yeah. you know, let you take it from here and explain what you do and. Awesome. Um, so I'll kind of just start out saying um, what we do in the hospital. So our main role in the hospital is to help children cope with the hospital experience and minimize the stress and trauma of hospitalization, which comes along with a lot of our patients here. Um, 
we have a strong background of child development and that's kind of where a lot of our work and language and interventions come from. Um, we work very differently with each age and how we help them through the hospital experience. Um, so like I said, our main goal with working with kids and families in the hospital is to reduce fear, anxiety, pain, and just try to normalize the hospital experience for kids. Um, so that's kind of our main role. It looks different for every kid and family. Um, Penny, if you would like to go to the next slide. So our team here at TMC, our supervisor is Heather. Um, so she kind of just delegates different tasks. Um, she's a great advocate for us throughout the hospital in advocating um, for our needs in the hospital. Um, our, we have somebody in surgery and radiology. I'm taking peds and PICU. I have been in the emergency department. Um, and then Carrie's in the emergency department. We also have a child life assistant. Um, and so her role is a little different um, while she's here. Before COVID, she was um, managing our volunteers. We have tons of the volunteers that come through here. We have pet therapy that comes through here. So she used to manage them. Currently, we don't have any volunteers right now. Um, so she is here a little less now. And so she is helping working on grants for us. Like we're getting a bunch of Xboxes right now, um, new Xboxes and working on other like music therapy kind of things um, for us. So she does a lot of groups with the kids. Um, like I said, helping the volunteers and our volunteers will sit with patients and hang out with them and play with them. Um, and then we used to have like groups under our tree. Have you guys been on peds yet? Have some? Some of us have. Okay. Some not probably. Okay, so um, currently we're in our picky right now. Our playroom is closed, which is unfortunate, but hopefully with me starting in Peds and PICU, I'm gonna try and see with Heather if I can start doing like little play sessions and bringing patients down to our playroom. Um, so I'm hoping for that. Um, so Jamie used to also help with these groups. So, and then we also have two per diems that kind of help fill in when um, we need extra help. Um, if you'd like to go to the next slide. <laughs> I kind of covered all of this already, kind of um, what a child life specialist is. Um, something I didn't touch on though is um, our background and kind of how you become a child life specialist. Um, it is a very competitive field. It's a very small profession. I think there's only like 10,000, maybe less of us. Um, I would say majority of child life professionals are in children's hospitals or pediatric units within um, a bigger hospital. And so we have bachelor's and master's degree. Our um, main coursework is child development, family systems, early childhood education. Some have social work. Um, so anything related to child development, we have to have a certain core amount of classes with um, classes of normal development. And then we have to have like grief and loss. We have to have medical terminology. Um, so we have to, once we get all of our classes done, um, and in the mix of that, we also have to have volunteer hours um, under a certified child life specialist. Um, you have to have those in order to get a practicum. You can have volunteer hours um, in other types of areas too, um, but you have to have like 100 hours under a certified child life specialist. Then you do your practicum. A practicum is under also a certified child life specialist. And during your practicum, you're mostly just observing the child life specialist. Our practicum here, we have um, them come up with different therapeutic activities, different group activities. So they do get um, to interact with our patients. They just don't get to do kind of um, the pre-procedural education and helping support kids through um, different procedures. Um, after your practicum, you do your internship and your internship is where you really dive deep into doing independent work with patients and doing that education um, 
and procedure support and all of that. Um, and then you just take an exam and then you become certified. Um, so that's kind of how you become a child life specialist. Um, so you're welcome to go to, yep, perfect. <laughs> um, so for you guys, um, when to call child life. Um, you guys are welcome to call us on our voceras. You guys are also welcome to come knock on our door. You can call our child life office. If you see us in the hall or you see me in the hall, um, you're more than welcome. I've had tons of nurses be like, is it okay if I come in and see what you do? You're more than welcome to do that. Um, it might not be on my mind to come to you and ask. So come to me and ask. Um, I'm more than happy for you guys to observe me. Um, but when to call us, um, pre-procedural education. This is a huge part in the emergency department um, in my role. And so this is educating kids on any type of procedure that comes through. Sutures, IVs, MRIs, surgery, um, really anything that um, is gonna be traumatizing to the kid, we like to educate them. Um, and so this is where I will really dive deep in using developmentally appropriate language with children. Um, where they can understand. Um, and during this part two, I will also come up with a coping plan for them for when the procedure is happening. Um, so that's what procedural support is, is really um, if the kid wants to be laying down, if they want to be listening to music, if they want to watch something on the iPad, if they'd like to blow bubbles. Um, sometimes we don't necessarily talk about it and sometimes I'll just know what to do during that procedure support. Um, so we also help comfort kids during different types of procedures. Um, and that kind of also varies on age to age on um, what I help with during that. So like for infants, I might not help as much, but I will help guide parents on what to do because the patient um, doesn't necessarily know who I am and might be more anxious if I'm providing the support. So I do a lot of like parent education too. New diagnosis education, you are welcome to call us for that. Um, we get a lot of consults from the doctors for that, um, but that are two main big ones here at TMC, are asthma education and diabetes education. Um, so we kind of just go in and talk to them about asthma and diabetes. Um, so that's sometimes a fun one to come in and watch um, us talk about. We also do therapeutic medical play. We do behavior modification, although I feel like that one is more if you're in like oncology or patients that are here for long term. Our population, I would say we don't do as much behavior modification just because they're in and out fast. Um, we also do developmental, developmental plans and schedules. So um, some kids that come, we have some patients that come in pretty often. So sometimes we'll just put a little, um, we have a plan already in place for them of things they like to play with, um, schedules that they have. Um, and so we'll put that in their room just for everybody to be on board with that. Um, then you can call us also for sibling support. Obviously that right now siblings aren't allowed here, um, but sometimes I have run into it in the emergency room um, where something traumatic is happening and dad brought kid and sibling in and I've had to take um, sibling away from what's happening because it is traumatizing for sibling to see that. Um, so that has happened in the past and just talking to them about um, patients, medical stuff and helping them cope with what's happening and what they saw. Um, we also do special events. So we help with like birthdays, any special monumental moments. Like I know in the emergency room one time, someone had to come in right before their prom because they broke their arm. So they did some prom stuff and took pictures for them in, in the emergency room. So we'll help with stuff like that. Um, we do stuff for Halloween and all the holidays too. Um, and we also help with bereavement support. Um, so when a patient dies here on PEDS, um, we just try to help support the family throughout that. This is personally my most difficult part of my job um, because there no, is no right way to help a family through that and they never know what they truly need 
Um, it's a difficult part of the job. Um, we also help with adult bereavements too. So if parent dies, we'll help and go talk um, with um, children about their parents' death and what's happening. And then another big part is just normal play, um, trying to normalize the hospital experience for kids and families. You are welcome to go to the next slide. I, I just, I just, I have, I have yeah. go ahead guys. Sorry, that's me feedback. Who had a question? Or just me? Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna try to stop being annoying. <laughs> Ms. Erickson, you're muted. There, okay. So since um, co with COVID and everything, you know how in the past we've done like reverse trick-or-treating and all that? I was wondering what you're doing this year. And my second um, thing I wanted to talk about is how play for children is their work, right, Kara? Uh, you know, oh, absolutely. If you don't continue to allow them to do this play, you know, it's how they're gonna process the whole experience and they will regress unless we allow them to continue to play while they're yep. in the hospital. Yep. So, so getting them, you know, making sure we're providing those toys, providing those activities. If there's schoolwork, these guys will also contact the school, right? Um, I believe that Jordan has done that in the past. Along with um, like Jessica, the social worker? Yeah, I believe so. I'll, I don't know, it'll be a new experience for me, but I know that we do help with, um, some hospitals help with like, with oncology patients, they'll help patients transition back into school. So sometimes child life specialists will go into schools and like teach the class about where patient, where, um, their peer has been and teach them about like their medical diagnosis and help them with that. But yeah, we also will totally help with like school if they need help with school. We have computers too. So, which is probably going to be even more prominent now since everybody's doing online school. Right. One of my favorite events that you do is the teddy bear clinic where you have schools from the community come into Marshall Auditorium with their stuffed toy. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it is super duper fun. I have only gone and like observed it. I've never actually participated in it, but I did um, that type of thing in grad school too for myself. So it's super duper fun. Right. And I, I think that goes right along with like the mission of Tucson Medical Center being a community hospital, you know, reaching out to the community in the different ways. Yeah. Child life, I think you guys really are a great, you know, resource for, for doing that. Yeah. I have definitely had patients that have um, gone to it and like talk about it when they come here. So it helps. And it, it is a great activity for the students to be involved in too. Yeah. Yeah, we get tons of volunteers and students that help participate in that. Um, I think we get tons of nursing students that come too. So if you guys are interested in it, I'm not sure what we're doing this year yet. Um, so it'll be interesting. Lots of adjustments this year. <laughs> um, but to touch on Halloween, we are, um, we are kind of still doing reverse trick-or-treating, except um, people throughout the hospital are going to go to the patient's rooms um, on the outside because we have tons of courtyards here. Um, so they're going to dress up in Halloween outfits and wave to the kids through their window. Um, we also kind of have like a scavenger hunt for the kids, so I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work or they're going to like have a checklist of I saw an elephant or I saw um, Goofy, that kind of thing. So that'll be kind of fun for them. Are, are you doing that on Saturday on Halloween? No, we're going to do that on the Friday when majority of our team is here. I'm going to be there. <laughs> Woohoo! I know. Awesome. This was information I needed to know. <laughs> it's the important stuff. Yeah. Um, are the students going to be there too then? I'll have a few of them. Yep. Awesome. Well, the child life team is dressing up as animals. So you guys are welcome to dress up in something. Okay. We'll, we'll talk to the nurses too and see. We'll come up. We have time. 
Yeah, I'm you did. <laughs> I'm excited now. Yeah, it'll be fun. It's always a fun day. Um, so like I was saying, a huge part of our job um, is understanding child development and how that relates to the hospital setting. Um, so when we work with infants, um, we understand that they are in trust versus mistrust. Um, and what this means is that infant needs to gain trust within their caregiver. Um, so the caregiver needs to respond to their cues of when they're hungry, when they're tired, how um, they kind of cope in the way that um, they put themselves to sleep and how they kind of just help themselves through stressful situations. Um, so in the hospital, I would say stranger anxiety starts to develop um, during this, but it's extremely present in the hospital for toddlers and preschoolers, more so than I would say that I've seen in infants. Um, but when working with infants in the hospital, um, a huge part of our job is kind of really just making sure the parents understand what's going on, seeing if there's anything that we can provide for them to help comfort their child. We have infant toys, we have mobiles, um, to me, a big part of working with them is kind of setting the environment for the infant. And so making sure they have a calming room, the lights are down if they need um, white noise or whatever it is that the parent knows that the infant enjoys. Um, when working with toddlers, they're in this autonomy versus shame and doubt. Um, so they're really wanting to gain independence. Their um, gross motor development is huge during this um, age. And so um, they really want to control their body. So the hospital experience can be really difficult for them. And they have a really hard time understanding um, the hospital experience because they can't conceptualize everything that's happening. Um, so with them, they really do learn through play and normalization. Um, so if we can get them up walking, um, bringing a big part is bringing them toys to their rooms, bringing them a play mat so they can get on the ground and play and um, keep developing that um, gross motor skills. Um, parental presence is huge with this age. Always making sure that a parent is there um, and during any type of stressful procedure. Um, during these stressful procedures, comfort holds can be a big part, and I'll talk about that a little later in this, um, but comfort holds for toddlers is great. Um, in the emergency room, I do a lot of bubbles with this age, a lot of like light toys, um, and just kind of nursery rhymes with this age kind of helps me. Um, I will go to the next slide. Um, so then when working with preschoolers, they are now in this initiative versus guilt. So they really want to control their environment and take on initiative and in doing things completely on their own. They're really in this fantasy and imaginative play and so again, with this age, it is also hard for them to understand different medical terms. If you see down a couple, um, they tend to like misinterpret things. Um, so sometimes if you say a CAT scan, um, you have to make sure that you explain what a CAT scan is. They might be thinking, oh, a cat is getting scanned or something like that. Um, so making sure um, you use proper language with this, um, age. Um, again, separation anxiety is still pretty present with this age. Um, and making sure that you give them choices while in the hospital. Um, what would you like to play with? Um, sometimes you can give them the choice of if they need an injection or something, and this will be throughout all the ages, if they want it in this arm or this arm, or sometimes when I am doing a nurse with the IV and a patient really wants it here, I'll be like, I'll make sure that the nurse checks there first, but like you can't make the promise. Um, and I would say toddlers and preschoolers probably are my hardest age to work with just because it is hard for them to understand 
wh why all this painful stuff is happening. Um, so they can be pretty traumatized. So making sure that we are allowing those outlets for normal play, normalization, um, different types of medical play. So making sure that we take the time um, to do that. And that is one of my favorite parts is just playing with kids. I would say school age is probably my favorite age to work with in the hospital. Um, so at this age, they are starting school. They're becoming more logical thinkers. Um, they are understanding what they're good at, what they're not good at, what they like to do, what they don't like to do. Um, and some of their stress in the hospital is kind of the unknown. Um, also painful pokes, anything um, that will be traumatizing to their body. Um, and so what I love about this age is because they are more logical thinkers and they can begin to start to think in the future, um, they ask so many questions. And so it is really fun to be able to educate this age and um, the hospital. So, um, but also again, allowing them for more creative outlets, um, really diving deep in medical play with this age is one of my favorites, whether that's just doing, sometimes we do syringe art, um, sometimes I will help them start IVs on their teddy bears. Um, so putting casts on their teddy bears too. So. Um, this one is really fun to do that with. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, then working with adolescents in the hospital. Sometimes this can be difficult with this age here, um, just because our population is so, they're here for two days and they leave. Um, and with this age, they are really developing their identity um, versus identi identity confusion. So really diving deep into who they are and what they want for the future. Um, so peer relationships are huge at this age and privacy is huge at this age. And so with it being such a short amount of time that they are here, it can be difficult to like dive deep and get to know who they are. Um, but making sure that you treat teens like an adult. Um, whenever you know something's gonna happen, telling the teen when this is gonna happen. Um, so just treating them like an adult um, is a big part for teenagers and giving them that privacy, making sure you knock before you go in. Um, so those are kind of all just tips into working with teens. Do we have any questions so far? If not, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is kind of just a chart of how important language can be when working with kids. Um, so on the very left, these are all, you know, when working in the hospital, I'm guilty of it too. Going to the floor, I say it all the time um, when I'm in the emergency room. Um, so just making sure you clarify, um, what that means. Oh, you're going to be going to another unit where you will be having a sleepover there, um, is what I like to say. Um, another big one, a CAT scan, like I was saying earlier, um, those preschoolers and toddlers might be actually thinking that you're talking about a cat and just saying you're going to be taking a special picture um, of your head, belly, whatever they're getting a picture of. I don't know if you guys know either, but we have this cool app called Kids Speak app and um, it's a great place to go. Um, we have developmentally appropriate language for a lot of medical terms that we use in the hospital and we also have pictures of our hospital, of our MRIs, of our surgery room. So when I go in and do that pre-procedural education, I show them pictures on Kids Speak app and it's like my favorite tool um, of working with kids and some are like, oh yeah, I've seen that. Or like they have never seen it and they have so many questions about it. So it's just kind of a great um, visual for the kids to know where they're going. Do we have any questions about any of these? If not, we can go to the next slide. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about some interventions that um, really help with pain management, just calming um, the pediatric patient and just trying to make a calming environment. Um, one voice. So this one can be a little difficult, um, but it really does help calm the pediatric patient. So the basis of one voice is just to have one voice talking to the patient, whether that's mom, nurse, child life specialist, it doesn't matter who it is, just having one person talk kind of just creates that calming environment for them. Um, so we kind of wrote it all out. One voice should be heard during the procedure. Need for parental environment, parental involvement, making sure that you educate the patient, um, making sure that you validate the child's words. Um, this is a huge part being like, it's okay to cry during this. It's okay to be scared. I know you're scared. We're gonna be here for you. Um, also offering the most comfortable non-threatening position. I'll also talk about that um, on the next slide too. So those are just our um, comfort for positions. Um, making sure you individualize your game plan. Um, so to me, this is a great part in making the child feel very comfortable. I think it's so important to find the child's strengths, to find the child's, like what they like, because um, they will be more comfortable with that. So finding whatever um, their strength is and going off of that. So whether they love Looney Tunes or they love Dora or whatever they love, um, trying to get a book on that if they want to read a book during whatever procedure they're having. If they want to watch that, do that. Um, choosing the appropriate distraction item. And then eliminating unnecessary people that don't need to be in there. Um, so sometimes before COVID, multiple parents and siblings could be in there. So um, sometimes getting the siblings out of there because that can be traumatizing for siblings, seeing them cry. Um, sometimes parents don't help, their anxiety is so high um, because they're anxious about what's going to happen to their kids. So sometimes we have kicked some parents out, letting them know that this is the best um, for the patient. Um, so just trying to get the least amount of people in the room will also create that calming environment. Hey, Kara, are you going to talk yeah. later about that vector? Is, is it called a vector or what is that called in the treatment room, that special it, treatment for this? Yeah, um, it is called a vector. I wish I had a picture of it. I don't have a picture of it. When we but, go through Pete's, I'll make sure I show it to them. Yeah, so um, I have not had a chance to really use it just because I've been in the emergency department. So I'm excited to um, start using it, but it's this big sensory box type thing. Um, so there's this like cool water thing. It kind of, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of it. Oh, a lava lamp. It kind of looks like a lava lamp. Um, there's also like balls in there for like kids that have developmental delays and sensory issues. Um, sometimes they really can um, get their eye on that and just pay attention to that. Um, so I'm excited to start using it a bit more now that I'm working in peds, um, but it is in our procedure room. And so whenever, whenever a kid needs any type of procedure, um, whether it's an IV, a poke, um, I'm not really sure what else they do in there, but um, we turn that on um, and it's kind of just another like calming part to create the environment. Um, if you'd like to go to the next slide. Am I doing okay on time? Okay. Um, so this is our comfort for positions. Um, so comfort for positions are just a great calming um, part for toddlers and preschoolers. Um, when they get to school age, sometimes this isn't really um, it doesn't really work with because they're so big. Um, but this is basically just having the parents sit in the child's lap um, because they do have that stranger anxiety and they want their parents' comfort. And so these are all just a different way um, 
that we have comfort for positions. So you guys are welcome to read through that, but I wanna make sure to get through all of this. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, so pain management is huge within child life. Um, we, kids' biggest fear in the hospital are pokes. Um, so whatever we can do to minimize that stress and that pain for them um, will help create a positive experience for them. Um, and so one thing that we do for any type of like injections, um, Buzzy works wonderful. Um, so it's a physiological pain blocker and you use it between the pain and the brain. Um, and so when a kid, I use it all the time for injections. Um, so say a kid is getting, it's kind of hard to show, but, um, sorry. <laughs> it's hard to kind of explain um, to you guys, but you put it in between the pain and the brain. If you guys have any questions about it, you're welcome. I'm more than happy to show you um, Buzzy. Another big one that we use in the emergency department is JTIP. Um, and so that's just an instant numbing medication for patients. Sometimes this one can be um, loud and scary for our younger ones, um, but a lot, like if you have JTIP and you have child life and distraction, once you give, give the um, JTIP, let the child calm down, then distract them, don't let them look. If they wanna look, they're welcome to look, but it really does help with the pain of IVs. Um, so that's our biggest user in the emergency department. Um, working on getting our nurses to use it more on peds. So that's always a battle with them sometimes. So um, that's why we believe it's so important to have that good teamwork with our nurses um, to be able to provide that therapeutic experience and um, helping kids be comfortable through the hospital experience. If you'd like to go to the next slide. Um, and then we have, this one we don't really use that often here at TMC, um, LMX, but it's basically um, just a gel that you put on where you're gonna do um, a blood gel or a poke, um, and it just numbs the skin basically. Um, I think a lot of our nurses like using the J-tip more. Um, another one too in the emergency room that's not on here that we use is let gel. And that's for any open wound. Um, so if a kid needs sutures, um, we put that on the laceration and completely numbs it. It's wonderful. And then something that we use with our infants is Sweet Ease. And it's just um, basically sugar water that really helps calm um, the infant. And you have to use it um, from zero to six months. Um, it doesn't really work with um, older infants. Um, and so anybody can really give that child life, MD, RN, PCT, and you just put it on um, their pacifier. Um, so doing this kind of before any type of painful procedure for infants. Um, and that's, I think, it. Do we, questions, anything else you would like me to touch on? Sorry, I had to unmute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, does, who has questions for Kira? So Kira, can you talk about some of the other tools that you have too, like the play, what kind of play dolls and how do you, how might you use? Yeah, um, so we have, um, they're called Medkin dolls and so, um, for asthma teaching, they um, show the lungs and so you can kind of open, it's kind of creepy, <laughs> um, but it does really help and just normalize um, the body and help kids understand a bit more, but you can open the doll up and it shows their lungs. So I love using um, that medical doll for asthma education. And then another one that I love using is I have a little play doll with a IV already in them. And so I will play on the doll and show them the exact steps of um, what's going to be happening to them. 
Um, so that's the main two areas that I use dolls in. Um, otherwise, we have these like blank dolls that we can give to patients and they can color on them and they can, um, we have also like little medical bags of like gloves, um, syringes, um, IVs we can give them. And so just allowing, sometimes just giving them all the medical equipment and seeing what they do with it. And then just addressing any um, misconceptions that they have, educating them on um, maybe why this teddy bear needs an IV. So um, that's why play is so important because like you said, play is the language of children and you can learn so much about child through play. Um, you can learn what they're thinking and what their thought process is. So that's why I love working with um, play dolls. Mm -hmm. So do you have any like favorite stories of experiences maybe in the emergency room. There's there's one nurse, when you're talking about the J-tip, there's one nurse in there that I, I, and I, I can never remember her name because it's an unusual name. She's kind of tall and thin. And yeah. She is so good with that J-tip. She uses oh, the IV. She, and it's, you know who I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Because <laughs> she is my favorite and she advocates for it all the time. And um, so her name's Kennery. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, and she always calls us. So she's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, but she always uses it, never hesitates. Um, but it really does like work wonders. Um, when I go in and prep the kids, obviously some kids have a hard time coping with the hospital experience. So sometimes there's nothing I truly can do other than try to be there for the child and try different interventions with them. Um, but I do really believe that using JTIP, educating them, educating the parent, asking the parent what you think will work best for their child. Um, so I love the JTIP. <laughs> and it is like, I know the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, like re requires, like what are the requirements for hospitals to have child life? Like if they're gonna care for children, so if they say they have a, I know all children's hospitals need to have them. Who has to have a child life specialist? I don't think anybody has to have a child life oh, specialist. Okay. I mean, so I, I believe recommended by the mirror. Yeah. I, right. <laughs> what? We need to change the laws. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody needs one. But I don't think there's like a requirement that children's hospitals need a child life specialist. Yeah, it's just, it's just become is. a standard of care. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So I guess I don't really know. I can ask my supervisor. She might know. I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask tomorrow. I'll ask around. Okay. So, <laughs> I think I, I should probably know the answer, right? I'm the teacher. Yeah, I probably <laughs> should too, but. I can find out. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and you know, it, I think it's interesting, though, because as I see what you guys do with children, I think, you know, why don't we have adult child life or adult life specialists also, right? You know? Well, it's actually funny because um, I'm really good friends with all the girls at Banner too of the child life team. And so one of the child life specialists asked, was actually asked to be an adult life specialist um, during COVID because nobody was getting um, visitors. And so she would go around to the adults units asking if they needed um, to like Zoom with any of their family members or if they needed any type of like activities and were bored. So she actually kind of jumped into that a little bit, but then visitors came back at Banner and so they no longer needed her. <laughs> and what day of the week does do the little, are the miniature ponies coming back? Um, I have not heard. So I assume not for a while. And I heard pet therapy is only back for employees, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Okay, anybody have any questions? We have an expert child life specialist here. So, welcome. Are there any special considerations you do with like children who are suspected of abuse? Ah. That um, is a good question. Sometimes I feel so, I think that's been 
another hard part of my job is realizing how many kids come through with abuse, um, especially in the emergency department. Um, majority of the time, um, there's not much I can do other than provide comfort items and normalize the hospital experience um, because they either get sent to Banner because it is such a trauma, um, or if it's in a sexual abuse, they get sent to, um, I forget what it's called, but they get sent somewhere else to get that SARS exam. We don't do SARS exams, I wanna say under the age of 13 majority of the time they get sent um i penny do you know the name of where they get it done no i don't yeah i don't either but i can look it up for you guys and ask around if you guys would like to know but um so i'm originally from chicago and they do have at these where they do get their um sexual assault exams um, they do have a child life specialist that does work at one of the clinics. And so she does a lot of play with the kids and educating them on what's going to happen during that exam. So um, there is a presence of child life, just not here in Tucson right now. But I know it is a thing in the child life world. <laughs> What other questions? Any? I have a question for like both yeah. of you guys. Um, so for the teddy bear clinic, is that ran through Child Life? Yes. So our radiology specialist puts it on every year. Um, and so she normally we bring all the kids from the community and there's different stations. Um, so like one station will be doing IVs. One station will be doing casts with kids on their teddy bear. Um, one will be a medical play where they just like play with the medical stuff. Um, so I really have no idea what it's going to look like this year. I don't even think we've started to chat about it <laughs> as a team yet. My other half of that question is yeah. if like it's possible and if PMI is okay with it, could you like send PMI like a list if you need volunteers? So like, yeah. like nursing students could be a part of that because I've done it and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Once we know our plan, um, we will make sure to contact you guys. I think you guys are always a part of it. So I'm sure you'll get the info once we figure it out. <laughs> that kind of segues into another question. How, how can, you know, what kind of donations are you accepting now for like Christmas toys or? Oh man. What kind of things uh, do you always use? Are you always taking new books or? Yeah, honestly, I don't, so I went home for three months because our hours got reduced. Um, and so I actually went back home for three months. So I just got back like three weeks ago. So I'm still kind of catching up with everything. Um, I don't know that we're taking donations yet. Okay. I, think, Fair enough. I know this is a whole new thing, isn't it? With, yeah. So I think they have to still contact Jamie. It absolutely has to be brand new, I'm pretty sure. And I think we just like quarantine the item for two weeks before we put it into our storage room. Mm -hmm. that makes I think that's what we're doing. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to put you on the spot. I just... Oh, no, 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 it's okay. Okay. I will make sure to let you guys know what... Well, I'll be around on Friday, so yeah. I can always, you know... I just always think that's fun to, you know, be able to help out and bring things yeah. for the kids. Yeah, I did Christmas for the first time last year and it was like such a fun time. So uh, we have a special team room. And so we put all of our donations that we got, we get tons of donations during um, the holiday season. And so we just put all of our toys into one room and we just let parents come in and pick toys out for siblings and um, patient. So it, it was a magical experience and it was extra cool because there was um, a patient that was dying 
And so it just was super extra special for that family and how appreciative they were because there was a sibling. Um, and so they just were like, so, so thankful. So that was like, probably one of my favorite experiences. Other questions? Okay, well, I'm, I'm just really glad that now they know that you are there for a reason. Yeah. You know, if you're doing procedures and your nurse isn't, you know, you can advocate for your patient. You can remind your nurse, can we call yep. Child Life first? Who's the Child Life Specialist? Yep. Always yes. procedures, right? There you go, see? Yep. You like that, right, Terry? <laughs> please, please. <laughs> and thank you, thank you so much for making time yep. for us. Yeah, absolutely. It was great chatting with you guys. And um, like Penny said, if whatever help you need with, don't hesitate to ask me any questions. I'm also here to advocate for patients. Call me for procedures. Um, so I'm here if you guys need help. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. You guys have a great day. Thank you. you okay. Thank great you. you can go ahead and you can take a 10 minute break. Those of you who have your PowerPoints, if you want to keep those, I can make you co-host or I can pull them up on Blackboard too. So, okay. So when you come back, we'll, we'll start with presentations.
Okay, is everybody back? Yeah, like we have a couple more minutes. Might as well get started, right? I think it was like what nine nine fifty four. Ten oh four. Okay. I do have um the first one here ready to go. Team team one, do you want me to go ahead and pull it up? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It's this one. Hmm. Okay, I don't have it. <laughs> no, I have it. Oh, I see what happened. I lost. What's going on? Here we go. way to make it bigger is that good so this is Letty's and okay hopefully you can hear me my connections kind of not good today I can hear you okay so we did our project on spina bifida. Um, our scenario, um, our mom's name is Samantha Jones. She's 16 years old. She just gave birth to her first baby boy. His name is Noah. Um, they both been cared for on the mom baby unit now for two days. Uh, Samantha did not have access to any prenatal care which made this uh, pregnancy high risk. Uh, Noah's dad is not involved. And the only support system that Noah and Samantha really have is Samantha's mother. Upon delivery, the physician noticed a protruding sac on Noah's spine. Noah has an obvious lack of deep tendon reflexes and Noah does not respond to stimuli. The infant was diagnosed with spina bifida and will undergo surgery. Whose slide is this? Go ahead and unmute. Was, was this one Bia's? No, I believe this one's still part of Letty's. Okay. So these are vital signs and physical assessment. So baby weighed seven pounds, four ounces. Um, blood pressure 60 over 40, temp 98.8. There's respirations 42. Pulse was 150 and he was satting at 98% on room air. Um, again, as stated before, the nurse noted the protruding sac of the lower back. Um, the sac was intact with no visible leakage. Um, the sac coloring was purple with a turf of hair. There was an absence of DTRs. Um, he does not respond to stimuli of lower extremities and there is no presence of anal reflex. Good picture. Okay, and then the path over um, spina bifida. So it's the most common, um, least severe 
neural tube defect, it's categorized by incomplete closure of one or more vertebrae without protrusion of the spinal cord or meninges. Um, when defects of neural tube closure occur, such as meningocele or myomeningocele, an accompanying uh, vertebral defect allows the protrusion of the neural tube content. So there's three types of spina bifida. Um, there's spina bifida occulta and myomeningocele and meningocele. Um, the spina bifida occulta, that's ca uh, characterized by a raised area and a tuft of hair over the defect. And that one is the mildest and most common form of spina bifida. Um, the mild meningocele, that's where we see that external sac containing the meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and a portion of the spinal cord nerve roots. Um, so that one is the most severe. And then for the meningocele, um, you see the external sac kind of like the mild meningocele, um, and that contains the meninges and the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so which one does your baby have? So our baby had the myel meningocele. Correct. So number two, so the severe one. Yep. So some clinical manifestations would be some visual external, a visual visible external sac protruding from the spinal area, which on the previous, on the picture you guys had seen, um, possibly a depression or a dimple, a tuft of, a tuft of hair, a soft fatty um, deposit, port wine nevi, or a combination of all, all of the um, abnormalities on the skin over the spinal area. Um, flaccid or spastic paralysis um, can be noted, absence of the deep tendon reflexes like Letty had mentioned um, with our baby, lack of response to touch or pain stimuli, um, some skeletal abnormalities such as club feet, constant dribbling of urine, um, relaxed anal sphincter. Um, as the nurse, you would assess you know, the sac itself, um, is, it, is the covering intact? Um, the color, like Letty had also mentioned as well. Um, sometimes there can be a little bit of skin breakdown around there, uh, which is kind of seen in the picture and which I've seen in other pictures. Um, the neurological status or involvement is really important. So is there any movement or response um, to stimuli in the lower extremities? Those seem to be the ones um, affected. Um, the anal wink is what they call it, or the anal reflex. Um, is it present or absent? So you'll see like, um, like the uh, bowel boom, it's kind of fl flowing like the dribble of urine or sometimes feces just kind of coming out. Um, it's also important to uh, measure the head circumference. Um, you wanna take a look and assess the fontanelles. Um, with mom, it's important to assess, you know, her knowledge and understanding of the defect and what her attitude or the family's attitude concerning the newborn's condition. We can move to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to, so the um, flaccid or spastic paralysis, it's mostly the lower extremities, right? Correct, which I had stated. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. And then the fontanelles, so we're looking for signs of what? What, what also accompanies this? With the, um, oh my God, yeah, what, what would happen if, they, if the head circumference started to get bigger and bigger? So we would be looking at like bulging fontanelles. Um, like if we are taking the head circumference too, it would be like a larger yeah. um, measurement. Like we're looking like high percentile. Yep, because they could be developing hydrocephalus because the ventricles aren't draining properly because of their spina bifida, because of the myelomeningeal seal, and then they might require a shunt. So this is, these are all, you guys are doing a really good job showing me, you know, excellent findings and everything. So I wanted to just make sure that we're all, you know, getting that why, why we're, why we're looking carefully at that head circumference and fontanelles. Really important. And for the diagnostic testing, um, so we have some image imaging, um, which can be ultrasound, but ultrasounds are not conclusive for, um, 
the NTDs or ventral wall defects. Uh, we also have spinal radiography, um, myelography, I believe if I said that correctly, um, a radiographic examination that uses contrast. Um, we have skull radiograph, radio, sorry, I can't speak today, <laughs> skull radiography for cephalic measurements, um, CTs to detect um, hyd hydrocephalus, um, ultrasound testing will detect the defect, while CT and radiographs will define the defect. Um, labs that can be done are elevated levels of maternal um, AFPs, uh, indicate need for further testing. Uh, fetal karyotype analysis can show fetal chromosome ab abnormalities. Um, AFP screening or the maternal serum, including um, HCG, unconjugated estrel, excuse me, <laughs> and uh, free beta SCG. Um, labs do not, do not diagnose neural tube defects, but they act as markers for possible compl complications. And the next slide you can kind of see um, in an ultrasound what that may look like. So uh, uh, surgery is done post uh, birth within 48 hours after birth. It's uh, used to preserve the function of neural tissues and to minimize the loss of function. Minimize the risk of ascending infection, which can result in meningitis. So the surgery is done especially to see if there's pressure in the CSF leakage or danger of the sac rupture. The more the earliest of intervention, the more the a baby has a, a higher chance of uh, of uh, preserving his uh, tissues. Management involves long term follow up with multidisciplinary team due to chronic nature of the disease. We have the physical therapy, the orthopedics, and the neurosurgery. Okay. The children will need ultra, ultra sonography and urodynamic to determine abnormal neurological bladder function due to risk of urinary, urinary retention and a ureteric reflux. What um, I found out was that uh, babies born with uh, MNF has a higher chance of UTI because they, they retain the urine and they cannot go to the bathroom and they have to self catheter you have to the nurse have to cat cat yeah cat so cut them or fully and then there's medications such as oxybutin to improve bladder capacity and effect infection can lead to renal function to deteriorate. So the fetal surgery is now a new thing that has been coming out in a couple of years. The goal is to uh, fix uh, the problem as soon as in the utero. The uh, mothers who are 22 weeks in gestation can repair the spinal lesion so they don't have such a high self uh, they don't have a high, uh, what's, the, what's the word for it? The, they have a higher chance of prognosis. And uh, first they cut the, the urine, uh, uterine stapler, and then they fix the my, myomengiocyte using a dura and a myofascial flap. That's it. Okay, so for our priority diagnosis, um, so they're going to have deficient knowledge related to insignificant, insignificant knowledge of neural tube defects as um, evidenced by status as a first-time teen mother, um, need no prenatal care during pregnancy, unexpected um, infant diagnosis after delivery of infant, and inadequate family support system postpartum. So our short-term goal is for the mother to exhibit increased interest and assume responsibility for own learning by performing necessary procedures with nursing supervision and ask five questions on condition and treatment care for infant 
um, by 1700, October 2nd. So um, our interventions would be um, asserting the mother's knowledge, ability, readiness, and barriers to learning uh, when uh, the mother has been told of uh, infant's condition and assessing the mother's method of assessing information. So noting if she's an auditory, kinesthetic, or visual learner, um, identifying support system for the mother, and if she would like to contact any family or other support system. And then, um, of course, providing emotional support and additional clarification of condition and treatment plan for infant. So, and then just reassessing the mother's emotional state during this time, and um, if she has any questions, so throughout SHIP, so like every two hours. Um, so encourage development of gradual and positive mother child interactions to avoid and limit unfamiliarity with new maternal role and acceptance of infants, myelomeningeal seal and appearance uh, by end of ship. Um, involve the mother's infant, involve the mother in um, infant's care by using appropriate materials tailored to the mother's literally, literary skills, questions and dialogue to increase mother infant association. Um, discuss one topic at a time and written information or guidelines for the mother. Um, explain prevention of infection and risk factors of rupture or leakage of uh, cerebral sac spinal fluid from the sac. So demonstrating and educating the mother on the use of like sterile saline soaked and non-adhesive gaze, uh, gauze to keep the sac moist and um, infant placement. So either you're going to place them in the prone or side laying position um, to avoid um, placing pressure on the sac. And then you also want to be encouraging the mother to breastfeed and assume like a normal feeding position. So I put that by um, 10 a.m. And then also just encourage educating the mother on the importance of adequate nutrition for the infant and then benefits of breastfeeding. So working with the mother to find a suitable position that does not place pressure on that sac again. And then um, alternatively demonstrating um, infant feeding with the head to the side or side lighting position. Um, educate on alternatives of um, infants urinary and bowel elimination due to lesion and paralysis. So demonstrating clean cath catheterization uh, via urethra and encourage mother to dis demonstrate, um, re perform return demonstration of catheterization with supervision. Um, encourage mother to interact with infant by talking and touching during feedings. Um, demonstrate to mother how to perform um, skin care to maintain skin integrity and prevent pressure prevent preventive measures to reduce pressure and friction um, when the infant is in the prone position during post-operative and uh, pre-operative and post-operative care. Um, once again, educate the mother on preventative measures to take for um, latex sensitivity. So helping to identify latex alternatives and reduce and reading consumer product labels to identify latex. Um, and then also continue providing emotional support and giving the mother time to accept the infant's condition. Um, provide assistance in long-term planning of required care of infant and resources uh, to help financially and local assistance available to the mother for ongoing treatment and care. And then provide uh, contact information and guidelines for emergency notifications should the mother sense or detect um, possible um, um, health emergency. And then can just consult with a referral for a social worker to work with the mother and infant. Okay, so I said that we should make sure that the mother understands that this condition is not her fault. There's a huge emotional aspect of this. So it can be very traumatizing for her to have a baby in general since she's 16 and probably wasn't planning on having this pregnancy. And now all of a sudden, she has a child that has a life-changing condition that's going to require lifelong care. So explain to her that there's no exact known cause of this condition. Um, encouraging her to follow treatment recommendations. Like I said, it's, it, everyone has said it's a life-changing condition that's um, going to be throughout the baby's life, um, which is going to require them attending multiple medical appointments and watching for signs and symptoms of change or the condition worsening. So she should be calling the doctor if there's new weaknesses, worsening bladder or bowel control, any headaches, vomiting, back pain, neck pain, trouble swallowing, stuff like that. Next slide, please. 
So again, there was our goal. Um, mother will exhibit increased interest and assume responsibility for her own learning by performing necessary procedures with nursing supervision and ask five questions on this condition and treatment care for infant by 1700 on October 2nd. So this is some of the ways that we were going to measure the effectiveness. So the first one would be monitor the patient's level of interest when demonstrating proper skin care for the infant. Um, we want to make sure that we're observing um, the mother's mannerisms and her facial expressions if she appears disgusted, if she appears scared or upset, so we can make sure we're addressing those concerns and we're communicating with her so we can move past that. Um, ask her to demonstrate how to breastfeed the baby because with this condition, depending on how she's holding the baby, we don't want to put any extra pressure on her sac or the, I'm sorry, his sac. Um, so we want to make sure that we're observing how she's doing that and making sure she can properly demonstrate it to us. If not, then we need to reteach her and assist her in learning it in a different way. Um, ask her if she has any questions on the baby's condition and give her lots of opportunities to ask questions. Um, she might be scared if there's other people in the room. Since she's 16, her mindset's going to be a lot different than others. And if she's got friends there, she might not be willing to ask the important questions that she needs to ask. So just kind of assessing that environment. Next slide, please. So we would also wanna provide all these additional resources for mom. Uh, the first website is a really helpful website that includes a lot of information on spina bifida. Um, it has a tab that I really like called Get Involved and the mother can go there. They have virtual seminars on spina bifida, on how to cope, ways to improve quality of life, other opportunities to meet local families who also have a loved one with diagnosis of spina bifida. The second one is additional resources. Um, there's a program on the second one that does in-home visits so they can provide additional individualized care for each different family. Then um, the SBRN Disaster Emergency Rapid Assistance Fund. That is a fund off of the first website where they provide like emergency financial aid to anybody who has spina bifida or have a family member with spina bifida and they have an emergency health crisis. Um, IEP is going to be an individual learning plan, individualized learning plan. So this child is going to have learning disabilities throughout his life and he's going to require individualized care for his learning. So that's information on that, which is um, going to be a written plan that mom comes up with the school and they work together to figure out how to best help him learn and to meet all of his developmental goals. And then the last one, since the baby does have spina bifida, the baby would qualify for social security benefits. She's 16, so she hasn't gone to college and probably hasn't decided on a career. So it might be really hard caring for the baby that requires a lot of attention and trying to uh, land a stable job. So this is a link to how to a page specifically about how to apply for social security benefits and what codes um, for spina bifida to get her those benefits. And at the bottom, it has uh, information on if she needs help filing a claim for that. Okay, very good. Um, you know, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some additional questions maybe in the discussion board to kind of clarify because, you know, the procedure of the, de the delivery of the baby, you know, I have some questions about that. I got some questions, you know, about just various things. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to put some further questions in there for you guys to then respond and clarify for all of us. Okay. That, thank you. Okay. So team two, do you have your slides available if I have somebody share or do you want me to pull it up? Let me see how quickly. That can be pretty quick. Okay, team two. All right, so we had neonatal abstinence syndrome and respiratory, syn I can't say that word, I'm sorry. Virus. Interstitial virus. RSV is what I know it as. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna present Caitlin's slide for her so if you wanna go to the next one. Yep. 
Oops. Why, 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 why? All right, so 25-year-old female Miss S delivered a baby girl at 37 weeks in the emergency room after being transported by ambulance at 0400 two days ago. Miss S is G4P2 and has had no prenatal care. Urine toxicology screen came back positive for opiates and co cocaine. Baby girl was taken to NICU after LND noted grunting nasal flaring and retractions with very low birth weight of three pounds, four ounces. Today, the baby has started becoming air hungry with periods apnea and slight wheezing her throughout the lungs. All right, so for the patho, um, RSV is a really highly contagious virus that is contracted through direct um, contact with respiratory secretion. So like a child like sneezing in your face um, or from particles that are like on contaminated objects. So like little kid wipes their little boogers, wipes it on the doorknobs, that kind of thing. Um, so RSV invades the nasopharynx where it replicates and then spreads down into the lower airway. Um, and then it spreads um, via like aspiration from the upper secretion. So that's how it kind of travels down. Um, it causes necrosis of the epithelium of the small airway airways and peribronchular mononuclear infiltration and plugging of the lumen with mucus and exudate. Um, so that's where the trouble breathing comes into play. Um, so the small airways become obstructed from like that mucus and inflammation and it allows for adequate inspiratory um, volume but um, it doesn't allow for full expiration so it leads to hyperinflation and eventually atelectasis in like really severe cases. And as far as neonatal um, abstinence syndrome, it's a compilation of drug withdrawal symptoms that result from intrauterine exposure to a variety of substance, substances. So um, opioids, barbiturates, SSRIs, benzos, alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine. So the withdrawal symptoms occur in about 60% of all of the newborns exposed to those drugs. Um, and even though the condition is treated as like a single physiological problem, it's really not um, like a single pathological condition, um, but like a big compilation again of those neurological and physical behaviors. So you're kind of having to treat all of those. Um, so it has both medical and developmental consequences for the newborn. So again, it's going to be your physiological stuff and then the mental um, deficits that can occur later. For um, the neonatal abstinence syndrome, I like that in the book it has like the acronym withdrawal. Um, so for withdrawal, the W would be for wakefulness or the, um, the baby would have less than three hours of sleep after feedings. They would be irritable. Um, they would have temperature variations and tremors. Um, also tachycardia. Um, they would have hyperactivity, high-pitched persistent cries, and hyperactive reflexes. Um, they'll have diarrhea, diaphoresis, and disorganized suck. Um, a respiratory distress, rub marks from moving around so much. A rhinorrhea and apneic attacks and autonomic dysfunction. They would have a failure to gain weight or just weight loss in general. And they would have alkalosis, but it would be respiratory alkalosis and also lacrimation. And for the RSV, um, for the observation, they would have differences in color, like little different variations of cyanosis, uh, respiratory distress, accessory muscle use, grunting, um, tachyp tachypnea, also periods of apnea and being un uninterested in feedings and surroundings, even the parents. And there would be audible wheezes like heard throughout the lungs. Okay, so for the labs and diagnosis, um, NAS is scored on a point based system and it determines the severity of the withdrawal and then that will determine the course of treatment. And this begins within the first 24 hours of life. 
and then depending on the points, they continue to score every three to four hours. And I've got like a picture of the breakdown on the next slide. So we'll look at that in a minute. And then, sorry. And then we've got, um, and then they could do a drug screen of the baby's urine and the meconium. And they could also do it with the umbilical cord. And then a positive test um, for this baby would show the opiates and the cocaine. Um, and then for RSV, it's going to be a swab test and it's going to be a narrow, narrow pharyngeal. So kind of like the COVID. So they just stick it way up in their nose. And then they can do a blood test to see if they have any of the antibody, not, I guess it wouldn't be antibodies, but they can do a blood test and then a chest x-ray um, for any further complications like air trapping or the atoscleptosis. And then, so there's your um, point breakdown. So it begins within the 24 hours. So if it's higher than 12, they continue to do it more often. And then it would start the phenobarbital or the morphine for the baby. And then it just continues on. All right, so for Nanda's, I did two. There's acute substance withdrawal syndrome related to secondary developed dependence to opioids as evidenced by tremors, excessive crying, and trouble breathing. We will want the patient to remain free from injury while in nursery. Um, and to do so, we will institute and maintain seizure precautions, provide a safe, soothing environment for the baby, and obtain a social services consult, and then monitor any interaction with the patient's mother just because she could be withdrawing and we wanna make sure the baby's safe. And then second Nanda would be ineffective breathing pattern related to, sorry, I wrote that twice, infection as evidenced by periods of apnea and slight wheezing throughout lobes. Um, we will want the patient to maintain a regular rate and rhythm between 100 and 160 beats per minute, hopefully on the lower end since tachycardia is a concern. And then a respiration rate between 30 and 60 breaths per minute while in nursery. And we'll just monitor respiration rate, depth, and effort every hour, off to breath sounds every hour, and then administer oxygen as ordered and monitor for response. So for patient education, um, for mother or family, for NAS, um, most babies who have NAS begin showing symptoms within a couple of days, but it can also take up to several weeks. Um, symptoms can last from one week to as many as six months. Um, the healthcare team can assess the severity of withdrawal um, using the NAS score like the picture shown before of the Finnegan test is most commonly used. Uh, the higher the score, the more severe. Um, so when caring for the baby, you want to decrease stimulation, provide a quiet space, um, an environment. Breastfeeding is always encouraged, but feed slowly. Um, some babies with NAS are comforted by gentle rocking. And for RSV, uh, infection is transmitted by way of direct or indirect contact of nasal or oral secretions, as Jackie mentioned. Um, it can survive on counters for up to six hours, 45 minutes on paper, and 25 minutes on dirty skin surfaces, such as hands. Um, so hand hygiene is really important. Uh, children who are born prematurely or who have chronic heart or lung conditions are at a higher risk and may have a longer course of the illness. Um, Polivizumab is a monoclonal antibody and may be recommended for future um, children in the future during RSV season, which is like September through January, I wanna say. Um, and keep the room warm. You can use a cool mist humidifier to ease congestion and coughing. Okay, some safety considerations um, with the RSV droplet precautions to be implemented. Um, and then like for TMC's setting, they have uh, six babies per room. So if you can, if for some reason six babies had RSV, you could group them in the same room. Otherwise, you'd want to put them in a private room. And they have like five in the um, NASA area. Um, and then obviously wearing a mask within three feet of the baby. And then... Um, neonatal hypoglycemia glycemia is a major cause of brain injury. So you're gonna to wanna to monitor, their, monitor their glucose levels and either um, administer like D5 or D10. Um, and uh, because the, the baby was um, 
SGA, which is small for gestational age, uh, you're going to want to monitor its temperature because they may not be able to control their thermoregulating. So that's something you're going to want to watch out for as well. And you can do that by putting them in an isolate and setting the temperature to, you know, whatever it needs to be. Okay. Okay, very good. You guys can hear me okay, right? Um, like, like the other group too, you know, I'm gonna post some post questions and everybody, if you have questions about certain things, let's post those and, and just answer questions, you know, like in the next couple of days so that, you know, we can have that part of it since we're a little bit short on time. Okay, team three. Isn't it amazing? Three hour class and I always feel like the time just goes by. Okay, I don't know if there's a way of making this bigger. How about if I do this? Can you can you guys see it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You could always pull it up in Blackboard too. Sorry about this. Oh, I see. Wait a minute. I saw something for a moment. What if I do this? Aha. There we go. I like that better. What do you guys think? Right there. Okay, let's go. Whose slide is this? You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. This is nobody specific slide, so I'll just read it. Thank you. All right. So we have a 36 year old African American woman who is G2 P2 a patient has uh, received prenatal care throughout her pregnancy and upon arrival for delivery. Her weight is 220 pounds. Blood pressure is 135 over 80. The patient's past OB history includes a spontaneous vaginal delivery of a nine pound, eight ounce male. Um, at 40 weeks gestation, eight years ago with no complication. The father of this child is not involved and her family history reveals that her mother has type two diabetes. The patient has been diagnosed with gestational diabetes through this pregnancy and gave birth at 39 weeks to a nine, nine pound, nine ounce boy on 929-2020 at 0800. Baby is presenting with hypoglycemia and hypothermia. Mother is doing well and resting at this time. So the pathology and etiology of gestational diabetes is characterized as a glucose intolerance typically developed during the 24th week of pregnancy. And so there's two categories to, uh, to gestational diabetes. There's pre-gestational, pre which is categorized as alteration in carbohydrate metabolism before conception conception. So this is going to include women who already have been diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And then there's gestational diabetes, which is altered carbohydrate metabolism developed during pregnancy during the fourth week is typically when it begins to develop. So gestational diabetes is caused by the secretion of a dio, diabetogenetic um, hormone that is secreted by the placenta. And women who already have some degree of like chronic insulin resistance and compensatory, compensatory, I can't say that word, um, increased insulin production 
is resulting in beta cell dysfunction before pregnancy are typically unable to produce enough insulin during pregnancy. And then an alteration greatly affects the body's or this alteration greatly affects the body's ability to maintain essential nutrients. And so in the last 20 weeks of pregnancy, human placental lactogen or HPL and growth hormone somatotropin increase in direct correlation with the growth of the placenta. And this is what typically causes the insulin resistance because it is secreting that hormone. And then gestational diabetes can be associated with neonatal complications such as macrosomia, which is gonna be um, LGA babies, which is typically over nine pounds, I wanna say eight ounces, hypoglycemia, and then birth trauma or maternal complications such as preeclampsia. All right, so our assessment findings for the baby, LGA baby boy, born at 39 weeks gestation on 929-2020 at 0800, vitals are heart rate 185, respiratory 35, blood pressure 94 over 65, temp 97.2, blood sugar 30, infant is presenting with shakiness, uh, skin is slightly cyanotic, the infant is showing, sorry, clearly I can't write, no interest in feeding and is lethargic. Um, assessment shows signs of hypoglycemia and hypothermia. And other clinical manifestations for both of these, um, diaphoresis, tachycardia, lethargy or weakness, shakiness, could possibly have seizures, coma, cyanotic episodes, apnea, bradycardia, respiratory distress, hypothermia, uh, poor feeding, hypotonia, and tach tachypnea, tachypnea, I can never say that, um, and then blood glucose level of less than 30 or plasma concentration of less than 40 in the first 72 hours, and then the thermal regulation of the they both go together, uh, bradycardia, poor feeding, and decreased weight gain, and then temperature less than 97.9. And then uh, some of the diagnostic testing and lab work that you would want to do is hypoglycemia because um, initially if you're born to a mother that's got gestational diabetes, there's going to be an interruption in the um, glucose supply. So while you are getting a hyperglycemic response in utero, as soon as you are separated from that, you'll become hypoglycemic. So ensuring that you're testing um, the blood sugar level on the baby will be important. Um, the thermal regulation will be important, so you want to um, assess the temperature. There can also be an electrolyte imbalance um, just because the parathyroid hormone doesn't cross the placenta. And so if there's a poor response by the infant, then there could be um, electrolyte imbalance such as hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. Um, and then the polycythemia and hyperbilirubinemia kind of go hand in hand because the polycythemia is going to be an overproduction of the red blood cells and it can make the blood thick and it can cause poor tissue perfusion. So as those red blood cells break down on their own, um, the byproduct of that is um, bilirubin. And so if you have uh, an abundance of that in the baby's blood, um, then they'll need phototherapy and things like that. So, you know, testing for um, the venous hematocrit as well as the bilirubin levels will be important. And then of course the weight and um, all of the other typical newborn assessments. Okay, so the treatment and management. So for um, the hypoglycemia of the newborn, um, we really want to encourage the mom to breastfeed as soon as possible. Um, this is kind of standard, um, just given the, the risk of transitional hypoglycemia, but since the baby does have risk factors, um, Prior to birth, we want to kind of have those steps in place. So if mom isn't ready to breastfeed, um, donor breast milk can be given as well, um, just because the lactose um, that is in breast milk can help with the baby's uh, blood sugar. Um, there can also be a sugar gel placed inside of the cheek prior to feeding. So they dry the inside. There's a photo on the um, left there. They dry the inside of the cheek of the baby, then place the gel prior to feeding, and that also can help um, raise the baby's blood sugar. Um, it, they can also do a sugar mi mixture of D5 or D10 via an IV. 
um, and more like extreme cases where they're not getting the blood sugar um, back up upon those management um, rechecks. Um, they can also do um, glucogen IM injections or a, um, a cortico steroid. Um, those essentially will either tell the body to stop producing as much insulin so that the blood sugar can raise in the blood um, or tell the body to create more, um, like release more um, sugar into the blood. Um, so management would be a blood glucose check. So typically the first one is after two hours and then three to five times a day for the first day to two, depending on the severity. Um, they will, um, th they'll do those prior to feedings. Um, also uh, close vitals, because a lot of these babies won't have um, a ton of symptoms and then they can rapidly get symptoms. Um, and like Sarah said, they can also um, turn into other conditions. And then you want to observe for worsening appearance of symptoms. You also want to um, educate mom on the frequency of feedings um, and quality feedings. And then temperature instability. Um, so skin to skin with the mother, super important, drying the baby off, postponing the baths to keep the baby, um, to try and keep the baby's temperature. Um, pre-warmed blankets, keeping the hat on because babies lose a lot of heat through their um, top of their head, um, utilizing a radiant warmer or an eyelet, um, and warm and humidified oxygen. So um, because if the respiration qualities start to uh, decrease, you can humidify and warm that oxygen to increase their quality of breathing and also the temperature. And then um, temperature checks using the axillary um, vitals with the blood glucose, because these two kind of play hand in hand um, with each other. So by improving the baby's blood sugar and by improving the baby's temperature, they're gonna kind of help each other. Um, and then adjust clothing. So making sure that you aren't overwarming the baby, because sometimes that can happen if you're trying to warm the baby up, then the baby can get way too hot um, and educating the parents on how to keep the baby warm. And also keeping in mind like how babies lose weight or lose uh, temperature by those four processes. Um, so making sure that they're not like put next to like an air conditioning system near the like wall. Um, you really want to keep all those factors in mind too when you're trying to keep their temperature stable. Okay. Right. Conduction, convection, radiation, great, and okay. All right, so I think my slide got a little messed up because my Nanda is like cut off halfway through. But um, the pri priority nursing diagnosis is a knowledge deficit due to misinformation as evidenced by the mother stating misconceptions and just a general lack of understanding. Our goal will be for the patient to verbalize understanding and perform teachbacks, um, understanding why her infant is um, large for gestational age, um, what exactly hypoglycemia is, and how that's affecting the baby's ability to thermoregulate and how those interact by end of shift. Um, first, we're going to want to like discuss these mis misconceptions that the mother may have, including understanding stuff like just because she has gestational diabetes doesn't mean the child will have diabetes and stuff like that moving into the future. Um, provide contact numbers for the patient's healthcare team um, on one document. This will give her a place to refer to. That way she doesn't either want to contact and doesn't want to look for the numbers or she feels confident and can reach out to the exact place she needs to if complications arise. Um, educate on the meaning of the infant's hypoglycemia and how prompt and regular feeding will be the best preventative measure against it reoccurring. Um, and then demonstrate proper techniques to help the infant keep warm, such as keeping him dry, using hat, proper clothing, crib placement, and then also how to just do simple things like taking his temperature properly. Okay. Then, Ms. Erickson, for my group, I have the PowerPoint pulled up if you want to just let me share my screen if that's easier. Let's give it a try. Okay, Ms. Hannah, you are a co-host. So see at the top where you click on the red share, you can share screen? Okay. Yeah, it says that you need to stop sharing your screen. Oh, <laughs> yes I do, there you go. <laughs> I need this thing to go away. Where is it? Where is it? Can everybody see it? Yep. Okay, 
So we had um, advanced maternal age with preemie that has Down syndrome and VSD. So I had a background or a case study and uh, so what I just came up with uh, there was a child that was um, born on Christmas Eve. She was a special child indeed. Before the birth, the family just with special genetic testing done to see if she was predisposed to any birth defects. They found out she had an extra chromosome. She was born with an extra 21st chromosome and a distinct facial appearance. This is when she was diagnosed with Down syndrome. Uh, and one day her parents noticed a bluish tint to her skin and uh, with further investigation of her skin, she was diagnosed with a VSD, ventricular septal defect. So a ventricular septal defect, the VSD, is a heart condition where the septum between the two ventricles has an opening. And so the blood is able to shunt between the two ventricles. Um, for some infants, depending on the size of this opening, it can like resolve on its own. But for our little baby, she'll probably need some surgical repair. Um, if it goes unrepaired, the shunting of the blood can cause some pulmonary venous return, which can lead to like left heart failure or pulmonary edema. Um, so this heart condition is like very common. Most babies who have trisomy 21 do have some type of heart like defect or condition. About 40 to 63.5 of patients with Down syndrome actually do have some type of congenital heart disease such as VSD. Okay, so the clinical benefit, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Because I have like had not had audio for a couple minutes, so just checking. Um, the clinical manifestations of VSD, um, the ventricular septal defect, so that includes shortness of breath, fast breathing, hard breathing, um, paleness, failure to gain weight, tachycardia, sweating, and frequent respiratory infections. It kind of it kind of got cut off, but you can see in the little diagram over there. So Down syndrome occurs when there's an abrasion in chromosome 21. Chromosome 21 ends up having three copies where it usually only has two. And Down syndrome commonly happens um, because of faulty meiosis of the ovum or it can also happen in the sperm. And three to f that's like the faulty meiosis is like 95% like of the reason that Down syndrome usually occurs and that like three to 4% is caused by a translocation of either chromosome 15, 21, or 22. And when there's an unbalanced translocation, it affects the long arm of chromosome 21, and that breaks and attaches to another chromosome. And then like the picture just shows that there's three instead of two. So the clinical manifestations for Down syndrome, so um, most of them are centered around physical appearance rather than um, like around physical appearance rather than like physical symptoms. So it includes um, a flattened face, small head, a short neck, protruding tongue, um, upward slanting eyelids, unusually shaped or small ears, poor muscle tone, broad short hands, um, increased palms. And then you can't really see it, but I just added this like another picture of what can like a diagram of all the symptoms. Taylor. I think she's trying to talk. She's unmuted, but we can't hear you. I mean, if her audio is not working, I can just... I yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry, Taylor. All right. So um, lab testing include um, karyotype analysis for chromosome mapping, which shows abnormalities in the number of chromosomes and can confirm the diagnosis of Down syndrome. Um, diagnostic tests can be done prenatal stage, and those are amniocentesis, chronic, I can't say words, Karyophronic villus sampling, precutaneous umbilical blood sampling, 
And all of these can help detect the chromosomal abnormality. Imaging tests such as a prenatal ultrasound can give the physician a good view of the baby and it can detect if there is a duodenal obstruction or an arterial ventricle canal defect. And then common testing for VSD includes EKGs, which will monitor the electrical activity within the heart, chest x-rays. Um, it's not always the best in the diagnosis process, but it, because it may be difficult to confirm the presence of VSD, depending on the size. Um, echocardiograms can detect like sound waves to produce a picture of the heart as it's beating, so the physician can visualize if there's a VSD present or not. So the treatment for Down syndrome it really depends on the unique needs of each individual. Um, things like special education, athletic, and occupational programs can be used. Um, also, early intervention is important too to identify the signs and symptoms. Um, physical speech and occupational therapy can also be used. Um, genetic testing of the parents can also be performed to um, determine like the risk of um, having another child with Down syndrome as well. Um, having a well-balanced diet and exercise routine to help maintain a healthy weight is important for them. And then, yeah, as I said, like, you know, there could be different specialties involved. You know, they, they are commonly do have cardiac problems, so they may have a pediatric cardiologist, and there's other specialties depending on their unique needs. And then treatment for VSD, um, most commonly it's going to require surgery, um, but if the VSD is small, they can... Um, just monitor it for a while frequently and it can close spontaneously. Um, medications used include digoxin, uh, ACE inhibitors, furosemide, or spinorac uh, spinorolactone. Um, they should be encouraged to eat a low sodium diet and, um, have, and use uh, and tolerate activity as, as, as tolerated, you know, engage in activity as tolerated. Um, and then the surgery again, depends on the severity. So in small defects, the simple suture closure is commonly used um, for moderate and large defects. They use a patch graft. And then for difficult or unsuccessful closures, they use uh, percutaneous transcatheter devices. Okay, so for nursing diagnosis, um, so for the VSD, I did um, decrease cardiac output as related to the congenital heart defect. Um, this can be evidenced by bluish tint to the infant skin, heart murmur, rapid breathing. Um, so we're gonna wanna refer this um, infant to a cardiac specialist, um, listen to the heart murmur every few hours, assess vitals. And then for Down syndrome nursing diagnosis, um, this child's going to be at risk for delayed development um, as related to the extra chromosome, um, which can often be um, shown through delayed speech and language, as well as other cognitive development. Um, so we can educate the patients on um, developmental delays, what to look for, um, give them an idea of what life will be like with a child with Down syndrome and um, possibly offer some community resources. Okay, thank you very much. So let's go ahead and we'll take 10 minute break, okay? And when you come back at 11, 12, I'll, it'll be my turn to talk, right? I haven't done, I haven't done any talking today so far. That's very unusual, huh? See in 10.
Hey, is everybody back? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to be talking more about atraumatic pediatric care in diverse settings, and we're in um, unit 10 now of our maternal and pediatric nursing book. And we're going to be covering chapters 30, 31, and 33 today. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of continue on for from what Kira was talking about. Okay. And, and notice, you know, the title of the class here is Acute Care Nursing Across the Lifespan. So I just want to clarify, don't take this critically or anything, because I know, I know you're all doing a lot of work. Okay. But when we're doing our um, you know, your outside assignments, and I'm giving you case studies, let's really focus on like the baby was, you know, just born, right? And now what are you teaching the parents like in the nursery more? Okay, so I, I, I maybe I didn't clarify that enough with this assignment, but I really want us to be, you know, I, it's not so much like nursing's role in health promotion and maintenance anymore. Now we're looking more at what's being done in, acutely in the acute care setting. Okay, so that, that will make it more fun and more exciting for you guys too, kind of bring us up to where we're at. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's really important to identify the different areas where children receive health care, right? Um, hopefully, all children are going to have a pediatrician assigned at birth, right, before they leave the nursery, and they're going to follow up with that pediatrician, and they're going, you know, and the parent's going to be good about making those appointments and bringing them in at two months and four months and six months, you know, in, in, in a week after being born to make sure that they're growing and that they're, you know, following up, you know, we're talking about immunizations and things. And so, you know, all children should be seen by primary care so that they have that health surveillance going on. Um, but there's also school nurses and, you know, but we're seeing fewer of those. We're seeing more health aides and school nurses are covering multiple schools. And you know some some churches have um, in the past there's been parish nurses. We're not seeing that quite as much anymore. But sometimes people do get um, you know there's health fairs and different education being provided or blood pressure screenings or something like that in in the church. There um, in youth groups and things there might be sex education. Um, so and and a lot of people include. Um, their faith and their beliefs in, you know, incorporated into health practices also. Um, the health department, right, is a good resource for people who maybe are low income um, or don't have other resources to be able to get immunizations for their child. Um, community centers often have health events. And of course, a lot of care is provided in the home. You know, moms and dads do a, a lot of band-aids and first aid and, you know, and then maintaining and, you know, giving medications. Okay, urgent care, surgery centers, the emergency department. So, you know, few, few ch children are really hospitalized every year when we look at the overall population of children. Most children are going to be getting their health care in those outpatient settings. But then under age five, you know, most of it's going to be respiratory illnesses. That's one of the leading causes of, you know, a child needing to be hospitalized. You remember our exemplars from last semester, RAD, pneumonia? And then, um, but there are, you know, a, a lot of teenagers have mental health issues. Um, we're seeing that younger and younger where kids are starting to be identified with mental illness. Um, you know, we talk about um, accidents, right? And I hate the word accidents when it comes to nursing approaching, you know, preventable injuries in kids. And I'm gonna talk about how if you have anticipatory guidance and when you have that interaction, like, you know, in the hospital, anytime we interact with parents, we're always doing providing education in outpatient settings. When the pediatrician seeing them, I'm sure those of you who have children, when you, you know, when you bring your child in for a well check, they're asking, okay, they're going to start riding a bike. Do they always wear a helmet? Okay, your baby's starting to crawl. Um, do you have all your electrical outlets covered, right? They anticipate, you know, do you have all the poisons up and put away? If you have a pool, you know, do you have that fence around the pool? You know, we're always looking at ways that we can help prevent injuries, right? All injuries are 100% preventable, even though, you know, I mean, in life, things are bound to happen, but they are preventable. 
Um, and then, you know, GI disorders also, you know, kids do get rotavirus and, you know, and salmonella and shigella and um, those, you know, there's, there are other infections, there's other injuries, broken bones, um, you know, children have also, we talked about the difference between congenital and acquired, right? So they could have, you know, really enlarged tonsils. Um, they can develop diabetes, right? So there's all those things. Um, and then when we get up into those teenage years, um, you know, then that pregnancy and childbearing does play, a, you know, and, and a lot of times with hormone changes in adolescence, that's when some of those um, diseases first, you know, the psychotic, the schizophrenic, the, you know, um, uh, manic depressive disorders kind of, you know, they'll, they'll start, first start um, suffering from those types of illnesses. And injury also because, you know, uh, teenagers think they're invincible. And also depression related to, you know, when we think about identity versus role confusion, right? If um, they're dealing with, um, you know, identifying their sexuality and there's conflicts regarding that, then that can cause issues for the family too. So and for the child. So when a child is admitted to the hospital, right? I used to, when, when, it, when the parent was first there, if I saw, you know, that they were, in, most of the time they are stressed, right? Because they had their day planned. Usually they had their day planned. And now all of a sudden, you know, the child's sick and they were up all night and they had to bring them to the doctor and the doctor said, go to, go to the hospital and here they are, right? They're thrown into this crisis. You know, there's sometimes when, okay, they've had this surgery planned and they knew it was coming, but you know what? A lot of times the surgery isn't exactly what they thought it was good. You know, maybe there's, you know, there's aspects of that that they did, they really hadn't planned for. So, or, you know, when things come up when your child's going to be in the hospital and then, you know, something happens, you know, military family, the father gets deployed. It's like, you know, so there's a lot of reasons why hospitalization can put stress on the family, you know, on the child, on the parent, parents worried about how their child's going to do, especially if they're in the ICU, um, you know, so just, just acknowledging that for the family and telling them, you know, I understand this is a crisis, you know, and like we said, you know, getting child life in and involving the parents, right, so that you don't have that separation anxiety. And so you're normalizing the hospital experience by supporting the family centered care. So I think um, that Carrie did a really good job about talking about kind of the, you know, separation anxiety being part of that, you know, especially at toddler age. Um, but then we see even your book kind of goes even a little more in depth about the specific kinds of behaviors we can see in kids, right? And, you know, um, you know, the child says, I'm sorry, honey, I got to go to work. The nurses are going to watch you and they're going to get a volunteer in here to play with you. And here, mommy's leaving. I'm leaving my, you know, my glasses right here. My sunglasses are here or my, you know, usually they won't leave their car keys because you need those, right? But they'll leave something to show, see, I'm still here. I'm going to be back for these. I'm just going to go check on work for a little bit. Mommy will be back, right? And the mom leaves and then the kid's sitting there crying and screaming, you know, and sometimes I would kind of joke around with the child and go and go, yeah, mommy, yeah, mommy come back right and the child kind of look at me like yeah right you know we protest together a little bit and then um and then they'll just kind of sit down and you can see the sadness come over them like they feel that despair right and you'll say here here's your toy don't you want to hug your beer and they'll be like no you know because they're like you know they're they have that apathy and they're not playing they don't you know and then here do you want your bottle no you know and they'll throw the bottle down right and you know and, and then they'll just be depressed and sad and then after a little while though you see they've isn't it kind of sad that they kind of accept that they, they're, they're, they're resigned then? It's like, okay, okay, I've, you know, mom's not here right now. I guess I'll just get on with life, you know? And then you can kind of, you can play with them and everything. And you'll think, oh, I'm making a new friend, right? And guess what? Their relationship with you is just superficial. They're just going to love you and leave you because the moment that mother comes back, they're going to be like, mom, you know? And then it's like, who's the nurse? Story of my life. But it's it still, I mean, that's how it should be, right? They should be bonded to their parent. So factors affecting a child's response to illness and hospitalization, you know, how long they're gonna be separated, the age of the child, the developmental level of the child, um, their cognitive level, right? How much can they understand what you're explaining to them? And, you know, previous experiences with illness and hospitalization, you know, if there's been a lot of recent changes, if there's been a divorce in the family or something, um, you know, 
if they've had preparation for, you know, if they've, if they've come in and done the tour with child life and, you know, they've been told, you know, that the mom, can, you know, the chair bed's there and they can bring this with them and, you know, and, and they've mastered the whole, you know, they're like, yay, I'm going to the hospital, you know, versus, you know, they're really sick and they get put in the hospital and then they get poked with IVs and they get poked for this and that. And it's been this really traumatic, you know, experience right from the start. Um, they're going to, they're going to be more stressed. Um, the temperament of the child, you know, it's, it's interesting how even when babies are born, some babies are just fussy and kind of, you know, um, not as social and everything or quiet and other babies are very social and playful. So that the actual temperament and personality of the child um, can affect how they respond to being hospitalized. Um, if they have innate and acquired coping skills, right? If they're self-soothers or if, you know, if they really enjoy certain things and, or, you know, they can just cope well. Um, the seriousness, you know, how sick they are, of course, is gonna affect how they respond to the hospitalization and what support systems they have, their cultural background and their belief, you know, if, if, if this is a strange environment, if they've come, you know, from a remote, um, uh, reservation, a Native American reservation or something. And now all of a sudden, you know, I remember um, a mother and a son who had come from a very rural area in Mexico, and they had just come to the United States as refugees. And she was sitting, the mother was actually sitting next to the phone and it rang and she jumped because she wasn't used to having a telephone in a room, right? Um, so, um, and, and of course the parents, you know, sometimes, you know, I've, you know, after you've developed that rapport, you know, kind of if the parent is very, very anxious, pulling them aside and reminding them that, you know, you know, parents do have sometimes they have to be reminded to be careful what they're saying in front of their child. Right. Um, especially if they're maybe, you know, if they've had a recent divorce and there's parents fighting in the room, the nurse has got to advocate for the child. Right. We have to help that create that healing environment. So, you know, there's all kinds of reactions in families and with parents, you know, um, sometimes, you know, one parent's going to blame the other or something like that. So um, hopefully not, hopefully, you know, it's as simple as just saying, Hey, we're all here for the child, or um, maybe it's giving, if they're, maybe they're really afraid to touch the child with the IV, right? So helping them know um, here it's, it's secured really well. All you have to do is make sure that you're picking up the tubing and just check the tubing and then if everything's clear you can pick up the child and or if you want to ring your light and have me come in and help pick up the child and hand the child to you no problem you know i'm here to help you and you know picking up on any of those any of those signs from the parent um i i feel like kira did a really good job too of going kind of going over those developmental levels right so um knowing that um children, it's normal for children when they're in a stressful environment to regress. So um, a lot of times we'll, you know, hear parents say they were totally potty trained and, and now we're back in diapers or, or they, you know, given up the bottle and now they keep wanting it, you know, um, and that's very, very normal. So um, just, you know, giving that reassurance that when they're home and they're back in their own environment, they will, they will go right back. They, they usually, you know, catch right back up to where they were. So preschoolers have a little bit better verbal and developmental skills, right? But they still have this fear of, you know, what people are going to do, you know, um, you know, it's, it's kind of cute. Some of their words, right? Mine, 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 and, and no, and, you know, and, and so the kind of the overall concept is to always allow children to make as many choices as, as they can, you know, don't tell them they'll be having a choice if it's not a choice. And I'll actually use those words. I'm sorry, this is not a choice. We, you have to take your medicine, you know, um, but you can give them a choice if they want it in the squirter, you know, in the syringe, the squirter or the cup, you know, do they want the squirter or the cup? Do they want a little chocolate with it or do they want a little cherry with it, right? Um, would they like bubbles afterward? You know, so take your medicine and you get the bubbles. You know, that's that's not bribery. That's positive reinforcement, okay? Remember that they interpret words literally, you know, like, um, like uh, Kara was saying, you know, you wouldn't say, um, we're moving you to the floor or, you know, um, 
I remember once telling the child I was writing stuff down and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm adding up your eyes and nose. And he said, what are you doing to my eyes and my nose? You know, so just being careful of how we're explaining things to children and they have some magical thinking, you know, and in fantasies and, you know, and part of that can be, I did something bad and now I'm sick. Right. And they can sometimes siblings, if they had a bad thought about like if they were mad at their brother and then their brother gets sick, you know, sometimes they can feel guilt and blame. So um, just kind of um, finding out, you know, what questions does the child have? And, you know, um, one thing she didn't mention that I think is also an important part is it's really important to assess and question the parents on how do they explain things to their child and what words does their child use? What words do their, does their child use for like potty um, or pain? How do they express pain? Um, you know, and, and just knowing, well, she talked about coping and strengths and stuff too. You know, so all of those things, you know, the more individual you can get in your patient care, the better. And then, you know, just knowing those different developmental levels, you know, Erickson, um, Piaget, Kohlberg, you know, where's that child at? And, and, you know, in individualizing it also, because not every child's going to be, you know, mastering that level. So if there are delays, then knowing what they can and can't do and giving them, you know, as much independence, it's really important for kids to, you know, maintain that. So as we see, you know, the children and the and how they cope, you know, they may ignore or negate the problem. They may try to be really stoic or passively access, accept it. They may start acting out, kicking and screaming. Um, and, you know, if it's a painful thing, you know, letting them know that it's okay to cry and everything, but how then also how can they help, you know, by holding still and, and um, anger, withdrawal, rejection, intellectualizing the behavior, trying to make sense of it. Um, you know, so suggestions to promote coping you know, um, teaching the child, you know, so if, if the child can't like do the incentive spirometer or something, you know, we have them blow bubbles or blow a pinwheel, um, distract with books or games and using imagery, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, a little bit older child, school age child, they can imagine they're at the beach and laying on the warm sand and just relaxing into it. And then, you know, if it's a teenager, I, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, if I, like I said, if I've developed the rapport, I might say, and there goes a cute butt guy going by. And then I always get a, like a little laugh from the teenage girl or something, you know, and, and then the mom usually um, chimes in with the certain boy, it might be that she's visualizing and we can, you know, so lighten the mood and, and help help uh, relax the patient. Music is a great therapy, right? I, you know, when, when Kara was talking about Christmas time and having people come through, anytime we would have like a flute player or, you know, the harp, we'd had a harpist come in, different musicians come in and you do see kids relaxing, less pain medicine being given, you know, um, Music can just be, you know, a, a wonderful therapy for us all. Of course, it's always important to explain the procedure. You need to collaborate with the parents and find out how to explain it and when to explain it. You don't want to go into a toddler room and say, oh, before you go home this afternoon, we're going to give you a shot. That child's going to be all worried about that shot all day, right? If you know a flu shot needs to be given before discharge, you wait till everything's written and everything's done. And then you ask the parent, you know, should we go to the treatment room? I'm going to have child life in there. What do you, what do you think would help your child with the pain, the buzzy or, you know, LMAX cream. We do, we do use the LMAX cream and especially for IM injections and, or, um, you know, distraction and things and, and comfort holding too. Um, when she talked about that, there is a, there's a great poster in the treatment room right next to the, um, the procedure table that shows different ways of holding children. Um, I really like to do this hugging method where it's chest to chest and then um, the leg is, you know, past the parent and then I can lock the knee and you can give the flu shot right in the vastus lateralis and then we give the child a sticker and a toy and and we're out of there and they're all happy because they get to go home because you know come come um october 1st it's mandatory for every person who's in the hospital to be offered a flu shot before discharge so we do a lot of flu shots 
you know, for parents, it is really hard for parents to see their kids sick, of course, right? So, you know, just realizing all these things are a stress on the parent. You know, you don't just have one patient, whether it's adults or wherever it is, the family is part of that unit. So, you know, and, and the family is going to be involved in taking care of that person. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, or, or fortunately, right, because we want caring people there helping us and being involved. So, um, you know, getting used to providing that education and explaining things and, and, um, and, and individualizing care according to their needs, right? We're not treating them how we would like to be treated. We're treating them how they want to be treated in terms of their culture, their ethnicity, their religious background, their healthcare beliefs, their, you know, do they get, take their bath in the morning or the evening? You know, all those, all those things, right? I know you know those things. So a traumatic care, you're not traumatizing the person, right? We're not bringing it, them in, they're not coming into the hospital to be further trauma, traumatized. They're coming to the hospital to be cared for and brought back to complete health without it being a traumatic experience. So that was just kind of in my own words. So what does that take? And your book uses this word. When you read this cha these chapters, it uses the word vigilance, right? Be vigilant. I love that because it's so true. Because anybody can walk into that, you know, room and do something to your patient and hurt them and traumatize them, right? It could be a, a well-intending radiology tech that goes in and, you know, moves the child and sticks a film under them and shoots their x-ray and takes, you know, and then you go in there and your kid's crying and all traumatized because they were in pain with the movement, you know, so watching your patient's room, coordinating care. Um, if the physician's going to go in and they're running short on time, you know, and you know they're going to rip that dressing off, you know, offer, say, hey, I have time. I can go get a he adhesive remover and take take my time, you know, taking off that dressing in a way that won't hurt, you know. So I, I just think, you know, in involving the family, um, you know, bringing in the multidisciplinary care team and doing patient family, patient family centered rounds, I think is really important to um, having that kind of therapeutic communication where everybody's able to, you know, share what the needs of the child, you know, what the goals are, um, you know, making sure that what you're doing is age appropriate and at the level of the child that, you know, we're um, making sure that the child understands what's going on. I had a little boy, you know, and this was back in the 90s when HIV first started, you know, being, so what year was that? that HIV, well, actually, it was earlier than that, that HIV started really being, you know, the uh, epidemic, um, you know, and it was just on the news and everything, right? But, but here's like this little boy who was like eight years old and he had an IV and I'd come on shift in the morning and, you know, he had gotten this IV and he was a new admit and I go in there and he's crying. And I said to him, you know, I sat down, I'm like, what's going on? You know, and, and he said, well, I'm going to get AIDS. And I said, why, why do you think you're going to get AIDS? And he said, they poked me with a needle. You know, and I, I had to say, you know, all, all needles don't cause AIDS, you know, and, and just went through that whole process of explaining, you know, where did you hear that? I heard it on television. You know, these are people who are out there and they find dirty needles and those needles have bad germs on them. We don't use those needles, you know, and, and you know, and you get people involved in everything. And you should have seen the relief on this little kid's face. I mean, he got it very quickly. You know, it's not something I had explained for long, but you know, but you could see where he would under, he would think that, right? So it was, you know, I, I just thought this poor child, you know, some of the things that kids see and everything, right? Um, you know, just some of these core principles and, and your book goes into this too, you know, what does it mean to provide family centered care? Have you ever had nurses say, people think we're a hotel at the hospital in acute care? What do they think we are, a hotel? Have you ever like stepped back and thought, what does that say about how we're viewing the needs of the family, right? If I bring them water, am I serving them like a waitress or am I providing for their basic need? All parents want when they're involved in their child's care 
is a place to sleep, right? A place to shower, a place to get food and to have food, you know, there and water and to be involved in their child's care and be updated, right? I mean, these are these really are basic needs. So I guess I'm just gonna share with you one of my pet peeves is when I hear people say that. And I, I understand that sometimes it's, you know, parents might have high expectations about things, but usually when you really reevaluate that, it is just them wanting their basic needs met. And, and we should go beyond that when it comes to family-centered care, right? I think we have the ability to really um, think about the whole needs of the family in, in more, you know, I'm sure we'll see improvements in that. So, and, and things are really improving. But when I was a child and I was hospitalized when I was two, um, my family left me, right? I mean, they, all, the, all the parents left the kids. They were in wards. We were in little cages and wards, um, you know, and I think, you know, I still, I still have like little memories of that too. So here's just an example from your book of some different comfort holding techniques for procedures and how you can have the child being held by their parent and still have access, you know, for a heel stick or an IV start or an IM injection. You know, of course, you have to make sure that the parent understands their role then, you know, and that they're not going to let the child jump out of their arms or throw their head back and hit the parent in the jaw. I mean, all of you who are parents, you've had that happen to you, right? So you do have to make sure that, you know, everybody's secure in what they're doing. Play therapy here, right? Allowing, you know, like this girl up in the upper left, if she's having to learn to do injections on herself, you know, practicing on the doll, pretend the doll has diabetes, um, or, you know, just... Um, looking at the developmental age, an older child, you're not going to have a doll out, right? School age up, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, use pictures, diagrams, and things at an age-appropriate level. So your book just uses this term health supervision, and it just talks about how, you know, over time, um, you know, the, the caregiver, the, the, you know, whether it's, hopefully it's the pediatrician, you know, is going to be looking at that development of the child and making sure that they're not having any legs, making sure that immunizations are being given, visions being screened, hearing, hearings being screened. Um, and there's a whole chart too on, you know, things that you watch for to know, you know, are they, are they getting to the age where they shouldn't be walking on their tippy toes, you know? Um, so there's certain findings at certain ages. So just review that. I know that in lab, you're also going to be looking at pediatric assessment and developmental screening tests more. So, um, you know, there's a lot of them out there. Um, how many of you, when you brought your children into the pediatrician, do they ask you, you know, are they, are they writing, you know, big crayons or small crayons? Can they feed themselves? Can they tie their shoe? Can they do buttons? Do you get those kind of questions? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I have. And they'll ask, like, um, are they able to speak in sentences, like four word sentences or three word or like, what's the biggest word they can say and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you for mentioning speech. I forgot about speech also. Yes. You know, because that is picking up on how well do they hear also and and be able to communicate. So um, just looking again at some of the different areas where the medical home may be, where, where do they go to access care and be, you know, have that health supervision. You know, and then that anticipatory guidance, right? If they're starting to ride a bike, do they always wear the helmet? And I, I like how sometimes the pediatrician will turn to the child and say, do you always wear your seatbelt in the car? You know, they won't ask the parent, they'll ask the child. So these, this is a whole list from your book of, you know, it was in box 311. What are the characteristics of that medical home, right? Um, family center care, right? Um, all, all of these things. So in terms of time, I, I don't want to go read them all, okay? So you can just kind of go back and read through them. So special issues, you know, if a child's chronically ill, if they're more of a, you know, medically fragile um, child, like 
you know, the ones that you were presenting today, you know, that child with Down syndrome and the heart defect, that child with spina bifida, myelomeningeal cell, you know, these, these are our children, the preemie baby that, you know, a baby that was exposed to drugs in her uterine, in her, in her uro, um, you know, and is going to have developmental delays. Those are all of our medically fragile children. Um, and also, we have a large population of, of um, refugees in Tucson also, and they do support each other. They, they're hooked up with resources. Um, but all those, all those um, resources too, so, um, like, do you remember when I, I brought up this story about the Hmong, the Hmong culture and that family and how they were accessing like care in Los Angeles in a healthcare clinic and she had seizure disorder and stuff. So I have more information on the Hmong history and stuff because I know we talked about that in previous semesters. Um, so that would be a, a example of a family that comes in and, and is interacting with a, a, a clinic and then, so, and, and then the issue too is, so for these, these um, children who are, you know, more vulnerable too, and maybe low socioeconomic, you know, when we look at what are the barriers to children being able to access care, um, you know, making sure that they have resources in their community, right? Where, you know, what's transportation services like? How far are they from, their services. All those things can either, you know, provide increased access or provide a barrier. So, you know, doing a community assessment of resources in the community for children. There was a time in Arizona, you know, we had kids care and kids had insurance. Parents could go and apply and, you know, and when they were hospitalized, we'd get them, you know, see if they qualified for access for kids care. And there was, a, there was a short time that kids care got taken away. And there was a big lack in our community and you know, resource with that, with those kids not being, you know, a lot of children who needed surgery during that time, the surgeries were, were postponed. Um, and especially, you know, children that have those acquired or congenital disorders, cleft lip, cleft palate, um, cerebral palsy, right? A lot of kids are impacted by those kind of chronic illnesses. Um, if they're born with cystic fibrosis, we're going to talk about cystic fibrosis as one of our exemplars next week. Um, so, you know, I just want to share, when we park in lot 11, we walk right past this building. It's the children's clinics, and it has a long history. Um, there's actually this Ted and Daisy Walker who started providing care for low income kids with um, congenital and you know, um, chronic illnesses. Um, and they just raised money and then the Shriners got involved and the Masons got involved. And um, now through you know, state, and state funding and private support, they have this beautiful clinic. And this is just a great example of a medical home model because Children who have multiple needs, right? Um, they can go here for um, for nutrition, PT, OT, speech, all their specialties. They have like ortho, um, neuro, cardiac. Um, they have dentistry, and they also have all their primary care services upstairs. And they don't just take care of the child. They'll take care of the siblings in primary care and the parents, if the parents are young, um, in like in their 20s and, and they're not seeing, they, you know, they'll, they'll ask the parent how they're doing too. And if they haven't seen a primary care for a while, they'll see them up there in primary care. Um, so they're really looking, you know, to coordinate services because a lot of these people come from rural areas in Arizona. They'll come, they'll provide transportation, they come here for the day, and then they'll get all of these services, you know, they'll, they'll have multiple appointments in one day as much as they can because they have a schedule of what specialists come on what days and, and that whole thing. And they're actually, I think, and this is from a few years ago, like 4,000 appointments a month. I mean, they really see a lot of kids. Um, and then there's also kids that are at risk, are, are children who have been adopted. Um, and so we see a lot of um, different illnesses related to kids um, who have been in other countries who may have intestinal parasites or other communicative diseases. Their growth and development may have been affected um, 
from their previous environment, vision and hearing problems. So those kind of issues are also covered in our reading this week. So the, the components of providing overall, you know, healthcare to children, right? Having that su surveillance of their developmental level, prevention of injury, right? And disease prevention with immunizations also. So, you know, thinking in terms of your primary levels of health promotion. So each supervision visit, you know, they get their height and their weight, vitals, look at their development, look at their behavior, look vision and hearing, you know, whether they're, if they're old enough to just say the pictures or if they can point to the direction the E is going, right? Or if they can actually say their letters. So you do appropriate at-risk screening, lead screening, anemia screening, they'll get their H&H, &H, they'll get a TB skin test. Um, they're starting to do better about hypertension screening earlier. We're, we were finding more and more kids um, because of earlier onset of obesity also that we can see heart disease, more hypertension in younger children in cholesterol screening. There's um, the immunization um, schedule is listed in your book also for all the different immunizations. And um, at, each, at each health supervision appointment, they'll get health promotion anticipatory guidance, kind of looking at where they're at and where they're going, right? So developmental surveillance, noting any parental concerns, ob obtaining that developmental history, how are they doing in school? Making accurate observations, consulting with relevant professionals. Do you need to send them to nutrition? Do they need PT? Are they having trouble with speech? Do they need speech therapy? So working collaboratively and getting out referrals. And then injury prevention is huge, right? Providing that education. What should they do if they get into, you know, poisons, making sure poisons are up, poison control, um, behaviors that are very typical for that age group, physical changes in the environment, always screening for child abuse, you know, mandatory reporting, for any, for any suspected child abuse. And assessing for risk, risk assessment in terms of behavior, in terms of development and, and then, so all newborns in the nursery get a metabolic screening for like um, glucose, urea, um, PKU, different metabolic screenings, um, hearing and vision screenings, and um, iron deficiency, lead screening. I think I, this was also in the other, right, list of with going to their medical home, other selective screenings that they can do with development. There's a DDST, it's a De De Denver Developmental Screening Test. That's a good test. That's a you know kind of a standard test for looking at how the child's developing. Um, in terms of disease prevention, you know our good old hand washing, right? Looking at the overall health of the child in, in terms of you know how is their immune system? Do they have any reason why their you know their health, um, their immune system, were, you know that would be compromised? Um, breaking the chain of transmission, right? We're we're seeing that right now. You know, wearing masks, staying six feet apart. That breaks the chain of transmission with COVID and um, providing immunity. So how, how might a child, a baby, right, get passive immunity? I'd be like milk, right? From what? Breast milk. Yep, from breast milk, exactly, yep. That's why breast is best, right? There's antibodies, and I knew that's what you're going to say, right, Haley? <laughs> is there another way? I, I don't know really of too many other ways. And then, you know, active, so you give them uh, immunization, and then their own body builds up antibodies to it. So, um, 
So here's where we're going with our discussion board, right? I, I have a whole bunch of links in here that you can, you know, all nurses, we should, we should be promoting vaccines, okay? It's a Healthy People 2020 goal. Um, you know, we wanna partner with families um, to, you know, prevent disease. Um, and isn't it interesting <clears throat> that I, I wrote this like last year, right? <laughs> Preventing devastating epidemics in the first place? Priceless, right? <laughs> so, um, but I did give you 15 questions that we certainly can debate, okay? So when we do this debate in the discussion board, I thought how funny after this last debate that we, you know, if anybody watched it on television, there, there was a lot of speaking over each other and yelling and that kind of thing. And I thought, huh, interesting. If I put my debate on the discussion board, there'll be none of that, you know, <laughs> there'll be none of that shut up or, you know, whatever, right? So we're gonna have a nice discussion board debate. And just to kind of take off the, the personal, you know, like um, if, you know, if anybody has, you know, we could have different views on it and that's fine. Um, uh, but so if, if we're doing this debate, let's do it with the, in the context of that may or may not be your true feelings on it. You know, it might not be your true position. So you can play kind of devil's advocate and say, you know, I don't think that's right, but you're not talking like you really don't think it's right. You're just talking like a character saying, you know, I think this, or because you can find all different kinds of facts and resources out there. You know, that's how we develop biases, right? We, we pick what we feel fits with our thinking. You know, I mean, some things, some things can convince us to change our thinking, but for the most part, we're going to look for that information that reinforces what, what we already believe. Did you know that? There's one of the links explains that. And I thought I, I was kind of getting a kick out of that. Yeah. So don't feel like you have to, so, um, okay, so this is a vaccine information sheet. Of course, anytime that you're giving a vaccine, with the flu also, we have to pull up this vaccine information sheet. Usually we have extra copies of it on the unit in, the, in a folder, so you can just pull it up. You can go on this website and get it in all different kinds of languages, all different, you know, the latest updated vaccine. When you're giving vaccines, you have to put the date of this vaccine information sheet on there that, and that it was given to the parent. And you need to like get informed consent. So you need to know basics of what this says and go over it with the parent, right? Let them know if, if the child could have some local redness, um, could develop, a, you know, a fever because their antibodies are being produced and they're responding to that, to that, um, vaccine. So, um, you know, some of the barriers to vaccination, right? It, inaccuracies in information. Um, parents will tend to, you know, they have to look at the benefit as being two times better than if I gave it and something happens to my child, right? So that's what they're afraid of. They'd rather not do something and, and then think, well, the consequence if the child gets sick, then it, they got sick, but if I give them a vac, if I sign for that vaccine and something happens, then I feel like I did something to cause my child to be sick. So it's like people will tend to, you know, they don't look at the air of omission as much as commission, you know, in their thinking. So, um, and, you know, vaccines are painful and, you know, they give a lot of them in the first two years of life. Um, and then there's that, you know, whole, theory out there of vaccines um, because at one point there was a preservative um, in the vaccines that could have possibly been linked to autism and stuff. So that still is very prevalent thought out there, but um, it has been proven untrue. So here's a whole bunch of links and they're short, but each of them have like kind of some different views and opinions and things and stuff. So I included all of those to kind of maybe help you um, uh, think about how, how you, you know, might want to respond to some of the questions. 
So some ways that we can overcome barriers, right? Combo vaccines, right? If a parent's really concerned about how many vaccinations their child is given, you know, there are some of these combo vaccines that cut down on the number of injections the child has. Another thing we like to do is, you know, when they're coming in for their appointment, make sure that there's maybe two care providers going in, numb up the legs, give, give the shots, you know, one, two, three, boom, give the shots at the same time and then it's done, right? So it can be done quicker. Um, I, I have that video too, you know, of that physician, because it's so cute when he's playing with the baby and getting the baby to laugh and everything. And he's given the shots without the baby even realizing he gave the baby shots. So you can watch that on your own time. And of course, in terms of overcoming barriers, you know, providing free vaccines to people of low income with the vaccines for children program. So, um, you know, I've talked about anticipatory guidance, knowing what's coming in terms of the child's development and helping the parents um, know what to expect. Oral health is, is an area that children, a lot of children do not see a dentist. So that's an area of health promotion that we really need to address going forward. Um, we need to look at obesity in children right? And, and encouraging, you know, children to exercise and parents to exercise with their children. Um, TMC had a program like that, um, where the child and the parent together attended, you know, health classes and, and discussed these issues. Um, you know, promoting hand washing, promoting um, sunscreen use in the family. Um, and then I have some select all that apply questions in here. And the answers are in the speaker notes. So, um, feel free to review those on your own time because I'm kind of out of time right now, right? But we got through the content. And as you'll see how this just really fits with the reading when you go, when you do your own reading, okay? So I feel like the discussion board is pretty straightforward. I've posted 15 questions. There's 25 of you. I'd like to have around four posts per question. So as you're going in there, if there's a question you really want to address, always put the number of the question in front of it, just so we can refer back to which question it is. And once there gets to be four posts on that, if you could just move on to another question so they all kind of get answered, okay? So they all get discussed. Have fun with it. If, if then, if you know all the questions have like four posts on them, then feel free to go back and make more posts on them and have fun with it if, if you're really into it, you, you know, because some of these are interesting. We could solve the world's problems in terms of immunizations, right? How many posts do we do each? Thank you. Three each. Okay. So and that's, I did. Is it three to like three different questions or are we responding to other people? Yep. So in there, I, what I put was um, there's three, three different ways that we're going to, um, debate this out, okay? Somebody's gonna do the initial statement or stance, right? Somebody can put in a rebuttal and then somebody can put in, you know, like a response to that initial statement or, you know, like a response to the rebuttal, right? And then you, you so you could add a couple of responses or a couple of rebuttals or however we wanna do that. Um, so there's, there's three different parts, but you could do, if you jump in there and you're doing like three stances, I'm fine with that, okay? But if we, you know, kind of facilitate- So just three posts, it doesn't matter. If you can either reply to somebody, reply to a question, just whatever we think is applicable. Yes. yes, and I added specific instructions too on a substantial post is five sentences or more. And I want resources with this, okay? I want you to be able to back up with your saying, you know, back up and defend what you're saying with, because wouldn't that be good? So we don't have to go do back and fact check what you're saying, you know? I don't want to fact check anything here. Just give me the facts in the first place. That's how it is. Yes, Hannah. Is this due on Wednesday night? It is. Yep. Yep, and it is graded. And I, I think it will be fun because it's so topical, right? especially with this, uh, you know, perhaps a new vaccine in our new future, you know, in our near future. Okay, any questions? Okay, I'll hang out if anybody has any questions, but 
Otherwise, you're free to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Raven. Are you there, Lily?